Welcome to the uh, regular meeting of the Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments. Uh, I'm Norm Steen, and I'll be filling in for Andy Pico today, who's traveling this week. So welcome. Good everybody to see you right here this morning. Got uh, another light agenda, but uh, no less important. Um, I think we have a quorum. Everybody's present. Uh, let's uh, open to a motion to uh, accept the agenda. Make a motion to accept. Okay. Second. Second. Motion to second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye, please. Aye. aye. Thank you. Okay, open for public comments. So any of those uh, comments from the public that are items not on the agenda this morning, welcome to come to the podium and address the group. All right, seeing none, we'll close that portion. Consent items, we have three items, the uh, minutes, uh, financials, and membership reappointment uh, requests. Anybody choose to pull one of those items off for separate consideration? Seeing none, accept a motion to approve consent yeah, items. Motion to second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Thank you, everybody. Or it's right off the bat to uh, CEDA. Welcome, Karen Rowe. Good to have you back. And Karen, you could have someone talk with us today, or you want to start off? I did that. Okay. Okay, yeah, I would say Dave Watt has All right, Dave. Can't imagine what project that'd be, but welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner. Yeah. Service. Mark asked me to briefly update the board. Uh, good morning, by the way. My name is Dave Watt, a resident here, works in the North Program for Mark Andrew and Karen Rowe. And Mark asked me if we would uh, provide a brief update on I-25 Cimarron, uh, the monthly status report. Uh, also, the upcoming <laughs> PEL for US-24, um, briefly on the US-24 uh, Plan Environmental Linkage Study, David Evans & Associates is a selected uh, firm. Uh, they have had the kickoff meetings and the organizational structure of that uh, environmental linkage study on US-24. Should I bring that closer? Is that any better? Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for the heads up. Um, the, the study has kicked off and has set up the team structure consistent of a technical advisory committee. Uh, there are a number of uh, entities here that are represented with uh, Rama, Callahan, El Paso County, Carl Springs, and the Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments that are, are part of that organizational team structure. Uh, the, the goal of the project is to uh, identify a preferred alternative and kind of establish that footprint moving forward of what type of projects would be coming forward with, what type of envir uh, environmental clearances would be necessary to implement those clearances, what type of right-of-way impacts might be expected with that, and kind of set the stage for the, the corridor improvements for, for US-24. And that uh, western limit, if you will, is Powers Boulevard, and it goes all the way east out to the El Paso County line. So that study is underway at the US-24 Pine Environmental Linkage Study. And I'd, I'd ask if there's any questions on that. Uh, it's being managed out of John Hall's residency uh, with Andy Steckline as his project manager. Okay. Sir. <coughs> Go ahead. Uh, it looks like you're Turner Smith from Raymond. It looks like you're already doing uh, car counts on that. Is that correct? There could very well be some traffic counts going. Yes. Uh, what kind of data do you get from those? Uh, can you can you differentiate? Uh, from lane to lane, uh, can you differentiate axle count from vehicle count, speed? I get to, act, I get to use my favorite environmental t term, it depends. Um, <laughs> the, the key thing they're going to look for there is obviously traffic volumes, peak hour movements, uh, also a, a truck, typical vehicle split. I, I don't know specifically how much information they're getting as far as axles and things like that. But that's the type of traffic information they would try to get for this study. Did I answer your question there? Or? Yeah, pretty much. Will, will those be uh, left there for uh, a short period of time, or uh, will you put those uh, out there for a longer period of time and then take them up, or what's it, what's it look like? I'm estimating that they'd be out there probably about a week. Uh, they don't go out there for an extended period of time, but um, if, they're, if they're seeing seasonal trends, they might have to go back out there and count that again to look at that type of travel if there's more summer travel versus um, commuter travel during the other nine months of the year. Thank you for your answer. 
Thank you, Shelby Tillman. Yeah. Nope. Very good. Okay, any, any other questions for, for Dave? Okay. Uh, One other uh, plan environmental linkage to tell you also that is of interest to the board is the I-25 uh, PEL that goes from Monument up to C-470. Uh, the selected consultant on that is CH2M Hill. Uh, they are not uh, formally under contract yet, but they have been selected as the uh, as the team lead uh, from the consultant side on that. And uh, there'll be further updates for the board on that as that moves on forward. Um, that's got a lot of interest from obviously uh, Region Two and the Pikes Peak Board, but also our, our Tismo Group, our Office of Major Projects, and certainly Region One. And that is, uh, we'll be moving forward in the upcoming months. We'll have a, a subsequent update. Uh, coming up perhaps at the June board as that uh, project kicks off and Rob I don't know if uh, that what you're expecting to hear I hope yeah and that's being run out of C dot region one that's correct then with the I-25 Cimarron project um, three days and counting I, I hope everybody that came along the interstate uh, knows what that message means mm -hmm. We are looking at a traffic switch, and I think this is a, a good first successful milestone that we're going to have uh, that's going to show some market improvement in the area. Uh, now that we're in phase one and we are impacting traffic, uh, recall we've, we've narrowed down the lanes to about 11 feet, uh, 55 mile an hour speed limit, and we've uh, cl closed off some of the lanes into and out of downtown Colorado Springs, so we have a congested work zone area. That's about to improve as we reconfigure the southbound exit ramp. Uh, the partial cloverleaf in the southwest portion of the interchange is going to be removed. And so as of Saturday morning, when you want to get off I-25 going southbound, you'll take a, a right-hand turn much like you do now, but you'll do it on the north side of the US-24 fountain overpass. And you'll tie into US-24 at a different location using that temporary bridge. And you'll be able to make a free right-hand turn. Uh, it's going westbound US 24. That's a nice change from currently when you want to go west, you're making a left turn. And I think we all know that those left turns are more challenged and they, they take up more space of the highway. So we think that's going to be a big improvement uh, as of Saturday morning. On Sunday morning, uh, we'll have a new southbound entrance ramp onto car, into 25 for the southbound movement. Uh, so those, those commutes that have been going on for decades, uh, there's going to be a different look and feel to it, and we think it's going to be a very positive improvement that we're going to see some ease of congestion there in the I-25 Cimarron area. I do have a question. Thank you, Mr. Right. Chairman. Um, so on the, the southbound um, heading west, that looks like a simpler move, but the southbound heading east, is, there, is it going to be like two lanes? Is it going to be queued or stacked to come down and turn left going east then? or To go it? east, there will be a traffic light to control that, but it will be a stop condition for that uh, with a traffic signal there in place. Is it going to be a two, and it will, two lane? It will, it will be permanently. I don't believe it's going to be two lane in Initially. the interim. Okay, but Correct. eventually it will be. Correct. Okay. okay. Any other questions? Go ahead. Anything else? Um, project is, is going well. It's on budget. It's on schedule. Um, we're seeing the bridge work come out of the ground. Uh, seeing some good work in progress with the deck pour on the US-24 over Fountain Creek Bridge. Uh, you'll be seeing some girders being set with two rather large cranes that will be coming in the first part of June. Um, and uh, we're going to continue to see progress on the southbound structures on I-25. We're very happy with the concrete pavement that you see in the west side of the highway. Uh, uh, had a good quality product that came out of there. And uh, I, I, I think we're progressing well uh, on schedule and looking forward to continued improvements as we come up. Um, we will be having those typical lane closures, if you will, that are going to become somewhat of the norm uh, for the next over a year. Uh, the contract ske uh, schedule, uh, Kramer has over 300 night shifts scheduled, so you're going to see a lot of work being done at night. And to do that safely, we'll be uh, having some lane restrictions uh, in the night, but uh, still committed to minimizing inconvenience by keeping three lanes open each direction during the day. But um, I, I'm going to call that uh, where we're at, and we're uh, going to come back next month and uh, talk about some of the added innovation that the, the, the Kramer CDOT project team is getting out of this uh, design-build procurement that we're, we're moving forward with. Uh, but 
on budget, on schedule, and looking forward for a positive change here this weekend. Wonderful. Very good. Thank you. Care anything else? We do have Aaron Greco here from um, Government Relations. He doesn't have to come up and say anything, but he's here in case there's any discussion on the um, proposed uh, bond bill that's coming up. So I just want to point that out. Senate Bill 210? That bill? That bond bill? Is that it? Okay, yeah. It died. It died. Oh, it it, it died, died last night. Yeah. Officially? Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, he came down. <laughs> <laughs> so if anybody had any questions regarding that, even though it's not moving forward, I just wanted to let you know that okay. he was here. But, okay. uh, no, does anyone else have any other questions on other projects? Okay. Um, no, that's all we have right now. We're good. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, real quick, stack update. Uh, stack met uh, last Friday. A little different format. Uh, rather than being in a kind of a table in the round, stack met small groups uh, because it's one of its primary purposes was a work session to evaluate the statewide planning process. Uh, Craig Casper attended the full meeting. I had to leave about halfway through, so I maybe just cover the first first part of the meeting. And Craig, if you got any comments on the statewide planning process, to let you come up in just a sec. Um, uh, there was comments, Jamie Collins, on the STIP update. The statewide uh, TIP uh, process is out for public comment. Um, it was an interesting note that our TIP, as you know, is also out for public comment. And our TIP is a, should be, by law, a <coughs> component of the statewide uh, program. So um, I don't know the extent of any public comments that have been received yet on the STIP. Um, as usual, our chair, Vince Rogalski, uh, gave a transportation commission update. One of the things, as you know, one of the bills that passed, uh, uh, 1018, House Bill 1018, uh, allowed direct stack input to the transportation commissioner, to, to the transportation commission, rather, uh, not only to the CDOT, but also to, to the TC. Uh, so there is some discussion about what that might look like, how we might have direct input to the full transportation commission. One of the items being considered is, for example, uh, an offsite. Uh, meeting, conference, so um, uh, how we might uh, influence only policy in progress and development of budget. At this point, we're kind of, it's in uh, process is informative, it's informational, but it's not decision related, so we expect that to perhaps change. Uh, during the TPR comments, I made a, uh, an overview of House Bill 1304. Uh, this bill eventually died, but 1304, remember, was a bill that uh, required public comment a public conversation was the term used for convening at least 15 statewide meetings, one for each TPR, for um, input by the general public on not only part, uh, project identification, but also project funding. Um, everybody, almost without exception, opposed that <coughs> bill, I think everybody, including the on this table, because it, would, it seemed to be confusing and provided another layer of input in a process that's, that's even mandated by federal law. So uh, that happily that bill died, and I, I did provide comments to that. But many of the TPR reps were not aware of that bill, and uh, um, fortunately it, it died a happy death. Greg, any comments on statewide planning? Um, I, I guess just a few. So in talking with CDOT, both at the statewide plan meeting and at the statewide MPO, uh, CDOT is committed to a continuous process instead of doing these sort of disconnected separate processes, doing a more continuous, and they are definitely working more towards collaboration on it, working with the MPOs. Like the last plan was done before the MPO plans were done. We're 74, 77 percent of the state, so we're a pretty big part of it as a, as a whole, and I think CDOT is, recognizes that and is going to work a lot more collaboratively on the next one. Um, any questions for either Craig or myself on stack issues? Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, next agenda item, um, an update from uh, Schriever Air Force Base presentation. And uh, Colonel Burt is not here. Uh, Colonel Slade? Yeah, yep. there he is. Got Good. It. Thank you. you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I'm the column. So yep. let's see what we got here. Make sure that we can pull this up to slideshow, right? I think we can do that. And this... Okay, it's in your packet if you... Right here. All right, so I'm Colonel Stephen Slade. I'm from uh, Shriver Air Force Base, and the only reason Colonel Burke couldn't be here today 
to present this portion of uh, State of the Bases is she's out at in Washington, D.C. doing her Capitol Hill visit. And that's an annual opportunity that she gets to go out there and meet the representative from Colorado and, and talk some of the issues that I will cover in, in the briefing here today. Some of you uh, were had the opportunity to come out to our State of the Base in February and get the same information. So, uh, But Mr. McDonald offered us the opportunity, and I think he's going to extend the same opportunity to the other installations as they hold their states of the base to come up here and kind of give those who couldn't make it out to Shreve Air Force Base really quickly uh, what, what their state of the base is. So without further ado, basically at Shreve Air Force Base, we do space operations, uh, and we also do cyber operations. And uh, we recently, with uh, the change of command, with Colonel Burt taking over a year ago, we came up with a new strategic plan for our installation. And that basically uh, outlined a mission, a vision, and some, uh, some priorities that we're going to cover during her tenure uh, and then set the path for whoever replaces her next year uh, that they can continue that, that effort forward. But basically, we command space and cyber systems and provide war fighting effects to people throughout the world. Um, and we do that through this three-level three vision of evolving the force. And, and why are we evolving the force? Our force, for many, many years, we do satellite operations out there. Uh, space has been a benign environment. There's a lot of satellites up there now, and, and it's not benign. People are looking at our satellites every day to, to cause us harm and, and to prevent us from being able to do our job. So we have to evolve the force to be able to meet that, that demand and that new threat that's out there. We're driving innovation. Just like everywhere across the United States, our budgets have been cut, right? Uh, and so we have to figure out better ways to do things with limited resources, uh, constrained manpower as well, but, but continue to do the mission and not let it fall off. One of the things that I think everybody in here benefits from on a daily basis is, is GPS. Uh, most folks don't know that the U.S. Air Force flies that constellation of you only need 24 satellites in the constellation to give you your GPS signal, but we actually have 40 satellites up there doing GPS right now. But we fly that and we provide that, that humanity service, if you will, globally uh, to 3 billion people every day. And we've got to figure out how to continue to do that in these constrained environments. And then the last part of it is mastering space, and that is just being, being the best in space that we can. We have near-peer <laughs> adversaries out there who would like to take that advantage away from us, and we have to figure out how to be the masters of that high ground, if you will. Priorities are pretty, pretty straightforward, right? So we're going to innovate our, our operations, uh, advance the professionalism of our crew and our force out there, and invest in the experience, the cultural experience of our, of our individuals. And that's basically taking care of the people that work at Shreve Air Force Base, that live at Shreve Air Force Base, and that have ties to Shreve Air Force Base. Our operations, we've been uh, really busy this last year. Uh, as you can see there, we, we added seven new satellites to our constellation. One of those was a comm satellite, the, the primary uh, new satellites were all GPS satellites. And then we got rid of four satellites. And, and this year is not going to be any different. We're going to launch uh, two new communication satellites at the end of this year and dispose of three more GPS satellites. And, and why do we dispose of satellites? So, so once they exceed their useful life uh, and we have newer satellites come into the constellation that have better um, capabilities, we want to get rid of the older capabilities so that we, we can grow our force, right? Um, so it's not, it's not a bad thing that we get rid of satellites. The, the really cool thing is GPS satellites, <coughs> typically uh, their, their lifespan is a seven-year uh, lifespan, right? Most of the satellites we have up there, are, our oldest one is 23 years old. Uh, so pretty interesting. We have, we have young kids, 19-year-old kids, that are flying that GPS satellite every day. That's a 23-year-old satellite. So pretty impressive crew out there. <laughs> Out of their GPS thing? Uh, so where, where do they go? Oh, when we remove it? Oh, so basically uh, we, we have a, enough uh, fuel left in it, and we just push it out of, uh, out of one of the orbits that it's in and put it in what's called a disposal orbit. So it stays in space, but it's, but it's that constellation, because of uh, the middle Earth orbit constellation that it is, you can't really bring it back to Earth and, and dispose of it that way. You just have to put it in a, in a, in a position that it will not affect anybody else. And so, but that goes to the whole thing of we have a contested envi or congested environment out there, right? It's getting more and more crowded and a lot of junk up there. Who knows? One day we may have a capability to go up there and, and take those out of completely out of and bring them back down and, and get rid of them. So, um, space training transformation is a huge uh, impact on our wing right now. 
we used to send all of our new recruits and, and new folks that are coming into space operations out to Vandenberg Air Force Base in California to get their training. That schoolhouse is closed down. We now do all that mission training on our installation, and that is big for us uh, because we can actually control, and not that AETC wasn't doing a great job, but we can actually focus uh, people onto whatever mission system that they're going to go to instead of getting a, a broad overview of how to do space ops. We say, okay, you're going to fly a communication satellite. We'll give you specialized training to do that. And, and, but, but it's big for us because we have to add folks into our training for crew force to make that happen. Uh, the space mission force, kind of talked about that a little bit earlier. That really is, we, we operate in a contested, denied, operationally li limited environment now. And, and for many years, our folks who flew satellites, they just said, hey, I have a satellite up there, it's healthy, it's doing its job, good to go. We, have, we, we are changing. This space mission force is under the, the pretense now they operate of, we have a satellite up there, it's healthy, but look, there's something next to it. What is that? Is that a Chinese satellite that's trying to do something to us? Uh, or look, somebody is jamming our signal. What can we do to make that signal robust or to get through that jamming and operate through that environment? So we're, we're changing the mindset of our crews to think about those things every single day. We used to just say, oh, there's a problem on the satellite, probably an engineering thing. Not anymore. Now it's, there's a problem on the satellite. Hmm. First thing we think about now is, is that an attack? So we're, we are really, uh, you know, changing that with the space mission force. And then on the cyber front, as you all know, it's, that's getting big in this area. Air Force Academy with the Cyber Center, uh, a lot of different things that are standing up. We at uh, the 50th Space Wing, uh, the Network Operations Group, has been asked to be a pilot program for a future uh, cyber squadron. And, and kind of looking at, you know, we, our, our comm squadrons in the past have provided computer systems, email. That's not what we need as we're fighting force. We need folks to defend our networks, right? We talk to our satellites through a communication system. We have to have folks to defend that as a mission system. And so the network operations group is, is part of that Air Force level pilot program that's coming on board. Some of our concerns that we have uh, consistently uh, out at Schriever Air Force Base is we know it's 13 miles, and if you don't know that, it's 13 miles to the east, almost to Kansas, but not quite, right? Uh, but uh, that picture on the left there, that's what I get to see every morning. Um, it, it's worse some, some days of the year. Uh, you know, as that sun just gets right over on, on your vision there. Uh, but that is our, our biggest focus right now is, is the highway safety um, between Shreve Air Force Base and, and Colorado Springs. And, and while we do have housing on the installation, um, we are primarily a commuter base. We have 8,000 folks that work on that installation and a little over uh, 200 families that live there. So do the numbers, right? A lot of folks are still commuting out there. And, and our number one focus is highway safety. Uh, so one of the things that we, uh, we always talk about is, um, you know, some of the, the trouble spots that we're seeing right now are uh, the Mark Scheffel and Space Village intersection, and we know that there's an effort out there right now. It's, it started this week, actually, uh, to widen Mark Scheffel and help with some of those, those, those uh, trouble spots. Another one area of concern for us is Falcon Highway and Curtis Road, and I know, uh, Commissioner Heiser, you asked to, to, to look at that, and uh, we have, there's a blinking light there. We had a couple... Uh, incidents early this year where uh, some of our kids on the way to school were uh, in an accident there. And so, you know, just a concern to us. So we, we, we look at those things and we always bring them up to CDOT and, and give our ideas and, and where we think we can um, make some improvement. So we're always looking for help there. And we'll keep advocating for that. Colonel? Sir. Uh, just received an update from Jennifer there in the back <laughs> that um, our traffic engineer has completed the field work on that intersection and is preparing the recommendations. Okay. So Wonderful. We'll, we'll follow up on that. Sounds great. Thank you, sir. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Colonel, you mentioned a feasibility study with Metro Transit. Yes. Have, uh, can you tell me about that or what? Because I know that that hasn't so, started so, yet. And no, it hasn't started <laughs> yet, right? So three months ago, I think in this forum, I, I brought that up and I think Colonel Burt brought it up at a different forum and, and asked. So. We used to have Metro Transit out to Shriver Air Force Base. Part of that was subsidized, I believe, by some, um, uh, some, some funds from federal funds, right? CMAC, okay. Uh, five years ago, that was turned off. The, 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 the subsidy was turned off, and then shortly thereafter, the bus service was turned off. Uh, we would really like to see if there's a, you know, a feasible solution to, to either bring that back. Maybe it doesn't make sense. I don't know. Um, 
one of the things that we do have right now with this space mission force is we have folks working 12-hour uh, shifts, and they're young kids. Many of them live on Peterson Air Force Base. If there was a, you know, we have to look at what, if the feasibility study bears out, right? But if there's a way that we could provide bus service from Shriver Air Force Base, a metro transit out to, or, or I'm sorry, from Peterson out to Shriver Air Force Base, we would take these young kids that have worked a 12-hour shift off that dangerous stretch of road um, at some critical times. So I don't know where it is. I, I know I brought it up here, and, and I'm, I'm hoping that it's moving forward. Hope is not the great, the best solution, but um, if anybody knows about that metro transit feasibility study. Can I follow up? Sure. Um, I, I'm not sure it requires a feasibility study. A feasibility study, in my mind, says a lot of money. Okay. But um, I think it does require some um, communication with Metro, Ma Me Metro Mountain Metro. Um, <coughs> I mean, I can tell you that right now we don't even have bus service to our airport, which is very concerning to me. And so we're, you're asking to provide bus service to an, an, an organization outside the city that's, that's even farther. So I know... Um, I'm also trying to promote some collaboration and partnerships with some of our hospitals up north because we're not providing bus service up there either. So I think the best way to partner and figure out how we can work together, um, maybe DOD could be involved. I think that that would potentially be the answer. And I, kn I know we have a fabulous vanpool program that may be a great option. And I would be happy to assist with that to okay. try to save all the organizations the money of a feasibility study. But um, That would be great. <laughs> so. uh, we do... Uh, we use the van pool good, for that's sure. Good to hear. That's one thing we use. Another thing that we do is um, we have a logistics readiness flight, uh, and we have a bus. Part of that logistics readiness flight is they have a fleet of vehicles, and that we actually lean on Peterson Air Force Base to get some of their transportation assets, so buses that, that do some of that transport for us. That's um, great. One of the things that the Metro Transit provided, though, was service to our civilian workforce, mm -hmm. our contractor workforce as well. Understood. So um, I did not know that there's a significant cost associated with the feasibility study, but well, let, I, let's I, talk about that. That's just in my mind. Okay. When I hear feasibility study, I hear right. money. Um, but, yes, I'd love to talk more. That would be great. Okay, thank, thank you, Colonel. What's Sir? the overall population for 12-hour shifts, both uh, military and the civilians? Yeah. What are we talking about? Boy, I do not know that off the top of my head. Uh, that, that would be part of yes, feasibility studies as, a, as yeah. a, a, a generic number that we throw on the table and say everybody come to a common location and then have the bus <laughs> at a given hour right. uh, within a 15-minute time frame, park and ride type thing for both the base and for the civilian sector mm -hmm. so that we could combine that, that particular mission. And you'd be doing the feasibility study for nothing other than vice uh, uh, sitting down and having a somebody with a hand counter going like right. this, yep. so I think you could assist the process okay. rapidly, and then uh, we could put our best minds forward and come up with a solution. We'll, we'll get on that. Thank you. Thank Appreciate that. Youth Center. Uh, so some folks were in a meeting that we had earlier this morning about this. Um, Shriver Air Force Base. Pretty interesting. It is the only Air Force installation that has housing although not very many houses, uh, that has housing that does not have a youth center. We don't have a place for our um, school-aged kids to congregate and to do things. That's a challenge for us, right? Uh, so we're looking at ways that we, can, that we can bring a youth center onto our installation. As you can see there, 980 school-aged youth in that area that could benefit from a, a youth center. Uh, we have the, the housing on the base, 242 homes, 97% occupancy rate. Uh, 306 children that could benefit from that. I think the 980 can also be a benefit to that as well. Um, but so there is an effort out there right now uh, in DOD to get us a youth center, and I think they've agreed uh, to provide us a 4,000 square foot uh, youth center. Uh, what we think the youth center, if you look at comparable installations, a youth center ought to probably be around the uh, 20,000 square foot size, and we're, they're going to give us a 4,000 square foot. Um, base uh, building, if you will. So kind of a challenge for us. But we'll take what we can get right now because <coughs> in the past we, we uh, in instituted a child development center for uh, preschool-aged kids, right? And it was a very small room. Over time, because the use increased, that was able to build out to what it is today, which has three different wings on it. And, uh, and we service a lot of kids at that, at that, 
that CDC. So we'll, we'll take the 4,000, but we're looking for ways to, to increase that, if you will, uh, in the future. And I know the boss is talking about that right now as she's out on the Capitol Hill visit to see if she can secure any kind of support for that as well. Summer youth program, kind of tied to the youth center, right? We, we have a bunch of kids out there that there's not a whole lot to do, and it's a long ways to drive into town uh, to, to, to do a summer youth program, right? So we have been successful in recently partnering with Ellicott School District to come up with a two-week summer uh, school program this year. And, and it is going to cover STEM, sports, nature, and fine arts, as you see there. All kinds of great stuff for kids not only on our installation, but kids that whose parents work on our installation that drive in from town, and Ellicott kids, right? So it, it's a start. It's, I don't know how many uh, openings we have, but the beautiful thing is, is Ellicott has come forth and said we will fund it. So they're going to not only provide some buildings, uh, and we're going to use our buildings on the installation as well, but they're also going to, this is going to be a free cost to kids to, to join and do for two weeks a yeah, summer program. So great opportunity. This will also help us get numbers to determine you know, justify a youth center. The, the bean counters want us to justify why we need a youth center, but we can't justify why we need a youth center if we don't have any, pro it's kind of a chicken before the egg thing. But we're, we're, we're pressing forward with that. So, 50th space wing. I don't know if this is going to work or not. I'm going to try this. Is there a way to make it go play? Maybe not. Yes. Here we go. Here we go. There'll be sound. <laughs> <clears throat> I am a veteran. I am a college graduate. I am a vegetarian. <laughs> I am Hispanic and Francophone. I am a youth season. I am a mother. For you, a soccer player, a golfer, a husband, a chaplain, an engineer, a civilian. I am Shriva. So this is a campaign that our uh, public affairs uh, folks have come up with, is to just kind of interview folks and talk about, you know, so Shreve Air Force Base is made up of folks that are part of this community, uh, and, and they're proud to be here, and they're proud to be part of Shreve Air Force Base and Colorado Springs. Um, Going to give you just a couple real quick glimpses of a couple of the folks that we have out there. So this young lady works on our installation. Uh, her husband works on our installation. And recently, she helped Colorado Springs Police Department in the apprehension of a suspect. So a Colorado Springs Police Department officer was having trouble uh, subduing an individual uh, after a bank robbery. She saw this individual having trouble, and she went out there and assisted. Now, this young lady is about this tall, but she jumped on this individual, knee in the back, and was able to hold him in place and, and help the officer uh, do what he needed to do to apprehend the suspect. So just some incredible people out there at Shriver Air Force Base, right? Uh, Jessica, you know, her, her mother uh, is part of the 11th Space Warning Squadron, and, and her mother deployed recently. But uh, just, a, just a snapshot of, you know, our military children are very strong. They're very resilient. Their parents go uh, into harm's way all the time, and uh, sometimes they don't know if they'll come back, right? But they are strong kids. Uh, I apologize. Um, <clears throat> you saw Frank in the, uh, in the video. This guy has done everything from, you know, being a, in the military to being a, a police officer, prison guard, you name it. But he drives out there every day, and he's our security off, uh, officer, makes sure that only the right people come onto our installation and have the right clearances, and facilitates those who want to see the installation uh, to get on our installation and, and see it as well. Airman Smith, big basketball player, right? Went to... Uh, Europe and played on a, uh, an Air Force League team there that uh, won a championship. And then uh, we got a lieutenant, uh, Tommy Taylor, who, who flies the uh, com, com satellites, who's also a, uh, was a bull rider at the Air Force Academy and continues to do great things. 
So these things are all posted on our Schriever uh, Air Force Base website, and uh, you can feel free to go and read their individual stories, and some of them have videos associated with them. But it is the great men and women of Schriever Air Force Base that, uh, that enable us to do our mission that I mentioned earlier today, of providing those, those effects throughout the globe. And I uh, appreciate your opportunity to um, share that with you today. Uh, if there's any questions, I'd be glad to take them. All right, so seeing none, since I still got the phone, we're doing military updates. I got just a couple things to add on here, right? <laughs> sure. Uh, I already talked about the uh, summer youth program. I wanted to mention two really interesting things that, that we've done as well. So Ellicott Helping Hands. Uh, our installation was recently uh, instrumental in helping Ellicott's food pantry. Uh, we partnered with Ellicott folks. The kids uh, on our installation were able to secure 2,000 pounds of food and over $1,300 in donations uh, to restock their food pantry that was, uh, it's, it's just a trailer that's parked next to their post office out in Ellicott, a semi-trailer, and it was empty. It is now full, and uh, by all accounts, they, say, they claim they have about a year's worth of, of food now to get through, um, which is, which is a, just a great thing, right? Uh, and then the last thing I'll share is a small business, right? Uh, we have a small business office at our installation, and Mr. Paul Aldrich is our, is our lead there. He recently won an Air Force level award for uh, small business administration, and, and he's been instrumental in bringing community small businesses out to Schriever Air Force Base uh, to do contracts, uh, to do things that, that we need done out there. So some of the, some of the um, local businesses that have been hired recently are E2 Optics, Apogee, and Rocky Mountain Medical. And these all have contracts now at Schriever Air Force Base uh, to provide us continued support in the, in the future, uh, future years, which is just a wonderful, wonderful thing out there that we can leverage those small companies that are part of Colorado Springs. And, and we appreciate uh, the partnership that we have with the, with the area. So that's all. Thank you. Well, of course, Light, thank you very much. Thanks for your service to America. And uh, please thank you all the airmen who serve every day. Uh, we'll continue online. Uh, Colonel Olson, any updates from uh, Air Force Academy? Sure. Um, I don't have anything as powerful as that to give you, so uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure Gary's, not, uh, Gary's happy about me going next. Um, so just some rent, some updates. Obviously, uh, I think I talked about last time, but graduation is uh, nearly upon us. Uh, we do have POTUS. Um, we will be distributing tickets out through the Chamber and Regional Business, Regional Business Alliance. Um, and then uh, most supporters are our POC for any other questions on graduation from the community, but uh, looking forward to it. Lots going on. Um, it's uh, we've done it a bunch of times, so we're we're pretty confident <laughs> in our ability to. Pull out. Uh, I keep getting nervous, and my guys keep telling me, "Don't worry, sir, we got it. It's all good." So uh, my first one to go through. And the graduation date is. Gra I'm sorry, graduation is June second. Yeah, June second. Uh, gates will open probably about 7:30. And the keynote speaker that day is? The President of the United States. Commander-in-Chief. The Commander-in-Chief. So uh, President Obama will be here. Probably will affect traffic that day. Yeah, there's, a, <laughs> there's some transportation between Peterson and the Air Force Academy will be impacted yeah. in the morning on the uh, June 2nd. So uh, heads up for that. Um, had a really good um, meeting last week or the week before with Councilman Bagley from uh, City Council, some land developers and the uh, city planners on uh, stormwater and noise. I just wanted to give an update here saying, uh, you know, we're working really hard. Uh, the developers are on board uh, kind of just making sure we're not teaming up, we're not doing anything official together, but making sure that we're keeping the conversation open for what those uh, encroachment issues are for the academy. Um, we have some do-outs back to the city in the planning and the planning department, and um, we've got some minutes from that meeting, so we're working on a website right now. Uh, I've got one more piece of information that I got to get downgraded that I can put out for public release. Um, I thought that was mine to release. It is not. I have to go all the way back, basically, to the Pentagon to get that released. So the, bureauc the beautiful bureaucracy is working, and uh, it will uh, continue to do the same. So I'm hoping to have a result on that in the next month or so. But uh, we're doing everything we can to get make sure. So we so we're good partners to make sure that people understand what's going on around the base. You know, the developers want to, you know, link to our website and let us, let their their buyers know and their real estate agents know and let everyone know, you know, kind of what what does the academy do? And flying operations is obviously one of our biggest 
uh, things that is noticeable to the public. Um, as uh, Colonel Slade said, we are working towards standing up the Air Force Cyber Innovation Center. And along the lines of everything that's going on now, Colorado Springs, as far as cyber goes, um, we're working from a, from a mission support standpoint, we're working on getting them a, some office space and redesigning to make sure it works for the, the great uh, cyber innovation that they need to do in there. Uh, we've got the money, we just have to kind of get the space designed. So we're moving forward to that and looking for a Milcon out in somewhere in 20 or so to build them a new building, but that's <coughs> We won't get our hopes up on that just yet. And then uh, I mentioned that I was down at the uh, DMTF this morning, but um, we should be signing, awarding a contract here locally. And I know it's not the biggest thing. It's not cyber innovation, but it's a new golf course clubhouse that I'm very proud of. <laughs> that uh, if you come out and if you get to golf at the Air Force Academy, uh, we've, we've been working on this for about five years, and we've uh, had a really good engagement with the State Historical Preservation Office, which is interested in all things that we do on the Air Force Academy from a construction and facility standpoint. So we've got a memorandum of agreement established with them as what we're going to do when we uh, tear down the old golf course clubhouse and replace a putting green. Actually, the most significant aspect that we needed to negotiate was a putting green. So uh, we've got that taken care of, and uh, that's really, that's Ken Olson's personal, from my mission support group commander, from the guys responsible for the golf course. It's a big deal to uh, the Air Force Academy to get, get that up and running and kind of bring us up into the, um, the modern <laughs> golfing world so and get us out of a piecemeal building that's built and built over about 40 years in about four different iterations. So, okay. um, depending on your questions, that's all I have from the Air Force Academy. Yes, sir? Uh, visitor Center, what's the status? Of so I owe a next, for the next meeting that both the DMTF and for this meeting, I can owe you an update on what's what happened, what's going on since post-Industry Day. We hosted up Industry Day three ago now I think it was I always look to Melissa because she keeps me in check um, uh, very well turned out and uh, it's run by the Air Force Civil Engine Air Force Civil Engineer Center so that's uh, down at Tyndall Air Force Base in Florida so we will I will get some more information to bring back to the next meeting just to give you an idea what's going on with the visitor center and the enhanced use lease of 53 acres out by the North Gate Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Pearson Air Force Base Colonel Corn welcome you can. All right, thanks. I'm Gary Korn. I'm the uh, 721st Mission Support Group Commander up at Cheyenne Mountain uh, here on behalf of my boss, Colonel Sess from uh, Peterson today. A uh, couple things I wanted to, to lay out. For, first, uh, just piggybacking, I am glad I didn't go right after uh, Shriver there. But, uh, <laughs> um, but I did want to go back to his GPS comment. So one of the things that the 21st Space Wing does is global radars track uh, all of the objects in space. And, uh, and report that to STRATCOM so they can catalog everything. And uh, so when, uh, when Colonel Slade boosts that GPS satellite out into an outer orbit, uh, the 21st Space Wing will be tracking it forever. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, also wanted to thank, f I, I see some faces in here that attended our 50th anniversary celebration at uh, Cheyenne Mountain uh, back on the 15th of April. The actual 20, uh, 20th of April was the actual anniversary. Uh, but we had a great turnout. We had a you know great event with uh, General Hyten, uh, uh, Senator uh, Gardner, and Governor Hickenlooper speaking at our event and, and saying some great things. It was great to get uh, the, the 50 years of recognition of the mission at Cheyenne Mountain uh, that that will continue on for you know 50 more years and more. Um, and uh, so a couple things. Uh, one other thing at Cheyenne Mountain is uh, we did a groundbreaking on our fire station expansion. So F Cheyenne Mountain Fire Department uh, provides a lot of service to the Broadmoor Bluffs area and to uh, uh, Fort Carson as well, a lot of support there. And, uh, and we're expanding the fire station, which is going to give us a little bit more. Uh, if you were in our fire station, there's like little um, – prison uh, room size cubbies that our firefighters live in 24-7. This will give us some actual living space and real uh, base for our trucks. So good things happening at, at uh, Cheyenne Mountain. Third thing I'll tell you about Cheyenne Mountain is uh, many of you know that in 2008, Nora Northcom moved out day-to-day -day operations, moved down to Peterson. And uh, they have about a third of the space inside the actual complex. The remainder of that space uh, – over time has become or is becoming uh, used again by different agencies. Cheyenne Mountain has turned into a bit of a, uh, uh, a data center, very attractive because of some of the, you know, the protections that the mountain offers to outside electronic, from outside electronics and all that. So uh, 
you know, this body may be interested to know that there's very little space left inside of Cheyenne Mountain. A lot of uh, capabilities have moved in. So uh, Cheyenne Mountain is here for a long time, I guess, is the bottom line. Now let me talk to you a little bit about Peterson. A, a couple of things that, uh, uh, that are coming up. 23 May is the next community partnership uh, initiative meeting, CPI meeting. That's going to be at uh, Pikes Peak uh, Community College Rampart Range Campus. Uh, so that's coming up. A um, couple of big things that we're also, uh, this Friday, uh, the NORAD NORTHCOM uh, change of command, 21st Space Wing, obviously very involved in, uh, in supporting that uh, for, uh, as we change out from uh, Admiral Gortney to, uh, to General Robinson. And then another uh, big thing that obviously uh, 21st Space Wing gets involved in is supporting these guys in the uh, in the graduation. So the Thunderbirds, uh, Air Force One, and a lot of other aircraft will be uh, taking up ramp space down there at Peterson, and uh, and and as was alluded to, will be transiting through to, to support these guys. So uh, we'll be very busy here in the in the coming weeks at uh, at Peterson. So that's all I got. Thanks. Thank you, Fort Carson, Rod Chisholm. Uh, good morning, Rod Chisholm, the Deputy Garrison Commander. Uh, just real quick, we're continuing pretty much some steady state operations on Fort Carson. We've got a, a brigade and a half, or combat aviation brigade, about half of that brigade is deployed, our second brigade is deployed, and that's pretty routine for us. We typically have a brigade or so deployed at any given time, so that'll continue through the summer, and we're training up some of our other brigades in the 4th Infantry Division for deployments as well. Uh, Major General Gonzalez is not changing command. He's still going to stay our senior commander at Fort Carson, but about every other leader <laughs> is going to be changing command over the summer. And so we'll keep you informed, and I know some of you like to come to some of the different ceremonies as, the, as those get all uh, finalized and uh, dates get picked. But right now uh, we know a lot of our leaders will be changing, but our senior commander will, will remain. Um, we're doing a lot in the community with transitioning soldiers. Folks may not realize it, but at Fort Carson, we're transitioning anywhere from 300 as a minimum to up to 450 soldiers a month are leaving the service, whether they're retiring or whether they're just uh, not uh, choosing to re-enlist uh, and leaving and transitioning. A lot of them stay in the local area because we've got such a wonderful defense-friendly community here in Colorado Springs in the greater area. So we have a lot of transitioning programs, we, uh, great partnerships with, uh, with the community, as I mentioned. The Secretary of the Army is actually here today, Look, not President Obama, but the Secretary of the Army is, uh, is here today. Uh, uh, and we do get a lot of visitors at Fort Carson just because of some of those dynamic programs. We are doing some things to support uh, some facility utilization, and it, and it crosses uh, it crosses lines. There's some, there's some units and activities, government activities, not all Department of Defense, that uh, the Army is trying to look at any excess infrastructure we may have to allow folks to get off leases and to move on to the, onto the installation. We don't have a lot of excess, but we do have some. So the Army First Space Brigade, uh, which is in leased facilities right adjacent to uh, Peterson Air Force Base, uh, we've offered up a building and they'll be moving on to Fort Carson and actually be part of Fort Carson. Now, a good thing, Colonel Slate, is we do not uh, launch and put satellites in orbit or dispose of any, <laughs> even though we'll have a First Space Brigade. But uh, uh, that's an Army unit that supports space operations. But we are continuing to look at uh, best utilizing the facilities we have as the Army's been reshaping with all the downsizing that, that you've heard. And that's pretty much all I've got for this morning. Good. Any questions? Uh, Bill, go ahead. Uh, are we talking about all the facilities there at the airport that they're currently using, they're going to vacate them all and go, go over to the base? Well, there's a, there's a building that we call Building 20,000 that will continue to be used. It's large. A uh, large uh, um, uh, building where uh, Air Force components are in there, using that Army Space Brigade is in there, and and some of our ra uh, some of our uh, training <coughs> materials are in there for contingency stock. But this is a whole other uh, building that the Army First Space Brigade will be moving actual headquarters into uh, onto Fort Carson. Okay, thank you. So, if I can add to that too, sir. So. Um, it was the Space Brigade that came out. So they're also looking at possibly using some um, land out at Shreveport Air Force Base 
uh, to build a building out there. So just okay. you talked about the ones that are located down at the airport, right? Specifically, they have that lease has been too costly for them is what they've indicated to us, and so they're looking to potentially come out. They, they came and visited us, I think it was two months ago, looked at some sites, possible uh, sites to build on, and uh, that's going through the process. It's a long process to get approval to, to do the MILCON out there, but one of those things that we're considering is we have 3,000 acres out at Shreve Air Force Base that, that is un, unused, a lot of it, and it's, it's pretty secure as well. So. Gallagher's uh, repertoire is of opportunities for, for the airport to use. Okay. Other questions for military leaders this morning? Okay, we're good. I'd like to welcome uh, Council Member Helen Collins to the, to the board. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Okay, uh, our next item is uh, item 5C, Executive Director's Report, Rob McDonald. Great. Uh, first of all, I'll continue on our theme of, of military. Of course, our joint land use study is uh, well underway. Um, and Angela Essing is in the crowd. She's over by the food. Um, this, uh, she's not getting any, though. Uh, <laughs> But uh, she, she's uh, actually going to depart PPACG. We're not getting uh, totally out of the um, She's uh, probably here through the end of May. And so we're out <clears throat> right now recruiting for a replacement for Joint Land Use Study Program Manager. Um, and so uh, we wish her well. Uh, this is her last meeting. So uh, she will do well in her next adventure. Um, and I'll leave it to her if she wants to announce her next adventure or just <laughs> Angela, you want to make any comments? Closing comments? Good morning. Good morning. Angela Essing, Joint Land Use Study Manager. As Rob said, I will be here through the end of the month. We do have one more policy committee meeting that I'll be able to attend for that also. Um, making sure that we have a very smooth transition. And I think what I want to tell you is that obviously we have an incredible team here. Brian Potts, Tom Miller, of course, also supported by Rob, and Rachel, and other PPACG staff. So it should be an incredibly seamless transition. Um, my leaving is completely unexpected. My husband is also military, um, and he has an assignment that I unfortunately can't pass up not going with him, although we've spent five of our seven years in different countries and different mm -hmm. states. Um, but this one I do want to go with him on. So. Um, that's the only reason I'm leaving. Thank you for all your hard work with uh, you joint hand use. It's been a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Yep. Hey, where's he going? <laughs> Not going to say. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say it. Uh, okay. Yeah, Rob? The, <coughs> so, yeah, the joint land use study is in great, great hands, and Angela's done a great job in the six-plus month, months she's been here. So that'll move forward. Uh, the other introduction I need to make, uh, <laughs> PACG has a new finance manager. Uh, Casey Partridge has joined the, the staff table, I guess, is, is where they are. Uh, she's been here two weeks yes. or so, uh, maybe less. Uh, so she's, she's learning uh, all the ropes from Beverly Majewski, who's, who's still in the building. I don't know if she's still in the audience. Uh, but she's, she's still here. She's going to go full time back to the Pikes Peak RTA. And so she used to run the PPRTA finances, and now both sides of the, that equation and that hat got a little too big, so uh, she's gone full-time there, and Casey is now full-time for PPACG. So you will see her emails and her name on the finance reports as they come forward. So a wonder welcome to the organization. Thank you. Uh, a few things from my report to highlight, uh, mostly on the, the area agency on aging. I know Joe Urban's here. Uh, the uh, good news uh, at the federal level, reauthorization after – Eight years, nine, six, five years. So it's been a while since the Older Americans Act has been reauthorized. Uh, so that's good news. That happened in April. Uh, also, on the, I'll call it good news. It's a little good, weird, bad. Uh, on the funding front, we got a little bit more federal money, a little bit less state, a one-time allocation through the legislature, through the homestead uh, exemption uh, for seniors. So bottom line, you can see in my reports, about 6.4% increase. Um, where that uh, translates into the services that we provide and those that we hire from outside folks, you'll probably start to see next month as the board will be asked to approve those service contracts with uh, the outside vendors. So that's a preview of that. Uh, you'll have it uh, your June 15th meeting. 
Uh, and last thing, uh, in transportation, uh, a lot of our transportation partners are, are here. We have a meeting this afternoon uh, with our federal partners and our CDOT partners uh, talk about our, our work program for transportation. So I'm glad they can uh, come uh, early and come to the board meeting because we usually don't see you guys. But uh, glad you can make it. Uh, one of the things we're doing as MPOs or the Metropolitan Planning Organizations, uh, years ago we used to run that, the, the collective MPOs. We used to host statewide MPO meetings. Uh, CDOT's been hosting that for years. Uh, some of the MPOs want to start hosting those again and travel around the state and see uh, from Grand Junction to Pueblo up to Fort Collins and certainly Denver and here. Uh, should be an uh, interesting uh, travel circuit. Uh, uh, I used to do it. Uh, Craig's, I think, he, he's been in here long enough. He's on the tail end of uh, when that transitioned. But uh, I think the MPOs and CDOT and the feds, uh, federal highways in particular, want to talk about planning issues, and we're going to start that again this afternoon. Uh, with that, I'll uh, take any questions or any parts of the report. Any questions for Rob? Okay, thank you, Rob. Uh, okay, we'll move on. Uh, we don't have a report from the Transportation Advisory Committee, but I want to invite anybody who's on that committee to make any comments uh, from the TAC. Jennifer. Mr. Chair. Welcome. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chair. Jennifer Irvin, and I'm the TAC Chair. Um, just wanted to advise you that um, we have been working with PPACG staff. We held a workshop on Thursday, April 22nd, which is actually the day of our regular meeting and then that morning. And as a result of that, um, did not have any action items uh, for our meeting, so that's why we don't have a report today. But we are continuing to work with staff on the TIP and expect uh, to have a regular meeting again this month and hopefully provide a recommendation to the board in regards to the items that are open for public comment. So, Great. Any questions you. for Jennifer? Okay, thank you so much. All right, next item is 5 E, as almost said, 5 Echo. Um, Community Advisory Committee. Jen. Welcome. Good morning. Jen Nellinger from the Community Advisory Committee. Um, just two things I want to raise. Everything was pretty much on the report. I do want to thank Angela Essing, who um, came to our committee meeting and invited CAC representatives to be a part of all the work groups. It was it was really um, a positive feedback for us because there were so many people that were interested in serving on those work groups, work groups and on our committee. So Angela, we're, we're sorry to see you go. <laughs> so the first two have already committed to um, being a part of the um, airspace over the Air Force Academy and they both live up north so um, they're excited to be a part of that. The other thing I wanted to raise and if I could impose upon Anna to pass these out We, we have completed our review of our bylaws and we have updated them. The committee approved the bylaws in summary, made some changes. That's exactly what Anna's passing out. And we're, we're tweaking some of the wording, it's minor wordsmithing, but these are the kinds of things that have to do with just terms, membership, and <coughs> it's meant to infuse new representation um, into the committee when it's, when it's possible and when it makes sense. Um, it's also meant to make transitions a bit smoother as far as officers go. So if you have any questions about any of the new bylaws, please let us know and I'll be happy to address that at our next meeting. Rob? Yeah, and the bylaws will come before you officially after the they tweaks will. are done. Uh, so you'll, it'll be your action as a board to approve your, your CACs uh, bylaws. Okay, I can see from here they're marked draft. So very good. Okay. Thank very you good. very much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next is the Regional Advisory Council. I thought I saw Joanne Ruth yesterday. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning everyone. I am Joanne Ruth from the Regional Advisory Council, Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments, Pikes Area Agency on Aging. Am I talking loud enough into the machine? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we uh, are... We are very pleased that we are being as a as a being very active with the um, innovations in aging 
uh, program for the friendly city, aging friendly city in Colorado Springs. Uh, we are very eager to have input into that, and we are very happy that we can do that. We have particularly two of our uh, staff members are leading sections of that. It's Kent Matthews is, the, is heading up the community support and health services uh, section of that program, and Carrie Schillinger is looking at uh, respite and social inter yeah, interaction inclusion. So what do we, we, as an area agency on aging, we have an opportunity to share our information, our knowledge with others in our community and gain knowledge from them, and I think it's going to be very impactful. We also have several volunteers involved in those organizations, in those committee meetings. They're happening over a six-week period of time. It's a really crash course in looking at our current and future needs in aging. Um, our TRS community, uh, subcommittee is deep into the, to the, the um, nuts and bolts of, of looking at our budget. Uh, we will be meeting on Friday for our long, our long meeting, and we're looking forward to that. I'd like to thank the staff. It's is an, is an incredibly um, expedited assistance for the, the TRS community, and I'm very happy to have that. Um, we also uh, had a very interesting and valid, uh, almost scary presentations from our uh, provider presenters last meeting. I'd like to share just a little tiny bit of that with you. If you suddenly lost your eyesight or it became dim, let's pretend that a huge fog comes into this room and we really can't see each other across the room. And if that fog got deeper and I handed out handouts only, it would look like there was nothing on them because you couldn't see them. That's what happens when someone who has lost their eyesight for whatever reason is handed a piece of paper or a PowerPoint. We might as well be in a fog. If you needed to help and didn't know where to find it, who would you call? How would you get that? I mean, I'm talking about something that you really wouldn't expect to need to know. Who would you call? What would you do? And, the, and then, if all of a sudden you lost your hearing, where would you go? What would you do? How would you know where the alarms were? Now, for each one of us, that would impact on this today's meeting, wouldn't it? If you couldn't read a thing, couldn't hear a thing, and what if, God forbid, you suddenly had a huge toothache and you were told that you were going to have to have all of the teeth on this side of your mouth removed. Oh, you didn't have money for that and it's not paid for, is it? Well, sorry. Those are the presentations that we, get, that we received last week, and that's where part of our funding is going. They are our providers. I can't think of a more personal meeting, the impact of who we are as people, than what we experienced last, at our last meeting. So think about what we treasure most in our lives. Yeah, we treasure lots of things, but the most thing we have is what we're using through this whole meeting. I appreciate this opportunity to just share some of my personal thoughts with you. It's kind of scary, isn't it? Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> what quick question, Joanne. I noticed May is Older Americans Month. Yes, it is, sir. Um, and and I, it was amazing. Um, my phone went off as you were speaking about a survey being announced for um, the Age-Friendly Colorado Springs Survey. That's it? That's it. And, and, and what did they invite you to do? Well, I, 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 didn't, I didn't want to distract my attention to my phone from listening to you. Well, well I, I, I'm honored. I'm honored. I'm bring, truly honored. I just want to bring that to everybody's attention. Yes. The survey invitation is now out. And we're speaking. Amazing. And, and so please, please respond to that because, because we, um, we have this wonderful opportunity 
to really do something very proactive in our, in our Pikes Peak region. And I am delighted to be a part of those, of those ongoing meetings, uh, and, and uh, it will be then moved forward. And we're hoping to have some really solid action to be bringing to our community, and it will be across the board. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I, I didn't ask the Any other questions, questions for uh, Ms. Ruth? Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, Mobility Coordinating Committee. Uh, very good. Thank you. thank you, Gail. Good morning. Good morning, Gail Nels, and I am representing um, the Mobility Coordinating Committee, and I'm the current chair. So I'd like to add a little bit more to um, the minutes, and I do want to thank Anna for um, being so um, such a quick learner with all the new acronyms and things like that. So thank you for taking these minutes. Um, I think most significantly, or what I'd like to flesh out in these um, minutes is um, during the public comments, um, not only are there the, in, uh, the three bulleted items there, but we also um, were talking about that the agencies around the table really do the work of the community. And we're not there asking for money just for ourselves, but it's to serve the community members that I think we all have collectively agreed upon uh, serving. And in fact, uh, Jen Godfrey, who was also part of the um, meeting that day, just said it was really our obligation to help educate you all as uh, decision makers about what we do and who we serve. So maybe I'll be trying to flesh out more of these um, minutes for you in the future. Um, so we had um, a number five. I just wanted to point out that um, not only am I the chair, but um, I think significantly uh, in this committee meeting, we have the three sectors represented. You have the public sector, the private sector, and as well the nonprofit sector. And I think that makes for a robust committee um, serving the public. Um, we also had a, a lengthy discussion about moving the minutes from a uh, perhaps from a monthly to a quarterly basis, and that uh, discussion really engendered well, what is our purpose? And I just really would like to highlight a little bit about what we decided, what we had done in the past. And so, in the past year, with Angel Bod, who has now moved on to other things. But um, we broaden the circle around the table, and I think that is um, important that we do reflect uh, the community um, at large. And we also leverage more uh, dollars into the community as being part of the uh, Mobility Coordinating Committee. And it was part of these faster awards from um, CDOT. And what that meant is when we were able to submit to CDOT um, as a, a, a solid group representing the community, different entities, we were able to bring more dollars into the community. Um, and I think our goals we were talking about, well, what should we be um, focusing our, meeting, our meetings on? Because maybe part of the reasons we wanted to move from monthly to quarterly was because we really weren't accomplishing something. So, and it is nice to get around and talk to people and, and have that momentum of case anything did come up, but maybe we should be more focused. And some of the things were, was one, to educate you as funders about what we are doing and what the community looks like, um, and to then to start sharing more data and, um, and our impact in the community with each other, and then to make sure that they're reflected in the minutes. And then, um, then to, to strive as a goal to create more um, availability of rides for the people um, requesting rides, because it is no secret that the demand is going up, but we have to figure out how to do this in a smarter manner. So those would be our goals for the, um, the next year. Um, I did want to also discuss a little bit about the 5310 grant process. I believe um, we did talk about this um, because, you know, the federal government has always said that these federal funds are more um, – how about this, the, the local areas should be looking at providing operating funds. And so their funds are more focused towards capital. Um, we do appreciate any uh, operating that is coming the way because they do deliver rides to our community. Um, it looks like uh, we do look at things on an annual basis as, it, as opposed to what says here, I think, a two-year basis, that um, we are working together to um, assess what the needs are in the community and to um, address those needs in a responsible uh, manner. Um, we, do, we do talk about the call center um, and what's, how we can be more impactful with these dollars to deliver more rides. Um, we'll see how all that uh, transpires. Um, and then we had an educational uh, presentation, and I'm not sure if any, we were all shocked and just would like to call this out. Um, that basically one out of four people in El Paso County is on Medicaid. 
and we were all shocked by those numbers. And so that would play into the people that are using our services. So do you have any um, further questions? Questions for Gail? Yes, ma'am. Um, Sharon Thompson Fountain, not a um, question, but just a comment. This is a wonderful group. If you ever have a couple hours in the morning to stop by, the providers are absolutely passionate. They have wonderful drivers. My son is fortunate to be part of one of them, so I have a little bias. But the gr it's, it's one of the most interesting groups you can, you can go to. Every month they have a very interesting educational speaker. And um, if you're not involved in that community directly, it would, it would behoove you to stop by and, and go to one of their meetings and just kind of see what's going on and um, what's being provided for um, special needs adults in your community. And just as a reminder that the schedule of all committees is going to include in your board packets if you'd like to know date and time locations. So thank you. Thank you, Gail. Question, Rob? Uh, not a question. Uh, on, on your table, we have a handout related to uh, mobility. Uh, Mountain Metro Transit uh, passed this out. Uh, 23rd Annual Bike to Work Day uh, has been scheduled. So we'll let you read that information. I'm sure it's on Color Springs website. Uh, we'll probably link it on our website as well. Uh, that's uh, let's see. It's June twenty second. Uh, I'm glad. It, uh, for years, it used to be right on top of this board meeting. Uh, so only a few of us could go ride a bike, get a bagel this year, and come over here. By show up sweaty here. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that's uh, now on the twenty second of June. So uh, you'll you'll see that again. But uh, they wanted us to share it early because registration is coming up. <laughs> All right. Very good. Okay, uh, next item are our action items, item 6A, Mr. Craig Casper. Good morning again. Um, this is an opportunity for the board to provide us additional guidance on the plan and tip uh, items that we hope to bring you next month for adoption. It's also a chance for anybody in the public to provide a formal comment directly to you. Uh, in the meantime, I'll give you a brief summary of our outreach activities. Um, we held our open house last night, and what we've seen is open houses become less effective over time. As an example, last year for the 2016 to 2019 tip, we had three attendees that weren't staff paid to be there. Last night we had one. So what we've done is recognizing this, we've gone out more. Um, so what we're doing is we're serving uh, ads out on Facebook. Uh, so far we've uh, served out as of this morning 15,600 ads, purchased ads have been served out on Facebook. Um, 329 of those resulted in the viewer clicking it, which is about 2%, which it's double the average, and is still a lot more effective than our open house. We've also sent email blasts out to 927 contacts. 29% of them opened the link, which is uh, national average is 22%. And 29% of the people who opened it then clicked to go to our website, which is uh, more than double the 12% national average. All of this has resulted in 22 uh, formal comments, which doesn't sound like a lot, but that's about 1,000% more than we got last year. We got three. Uh, so uh, we're, we're, the electronic media is working uh, better. The comments we've gotten will not surprise you. We need more maintenance of our roads. We need more transit service, and we need more bike trails. That's sort of the, cons the comments that we're getting, so nothing surprising. So, uh, Are you one of the respondents, Brett? No. Oh. Okay. We're going to get in 23. <laughs> uh, are there any comments, questions? Anybody in the public would like to comment? That's good. Yeah. So again, this is an opportunity to provide additional input and guidance to PPACG staff. No questions. No guidance on 6A, 6B. And what I said, ditto, except that we're, we're actually not getting – Long-range plans don't engage as well as actual projects, so we, I don't think we've gotten any comments on our amendment to the plan. Um, it's just sort of esoteric. It's out there 25 years, and so. But also opportunity for guidance or comment? The long-range plan. This is the, out, out to the 2040 yes. long-range plan, so thinking ahead here. Okay. Seeing none, thank you very much. All right, very good. Uh, move on to item seven, information items. Our legislative update, the last day. The Colorado Assembly is today. Any breaking news this morning, Rachel? <laughs> yeah. I just want to say how much I appreciate your legislative updates. I know there's I don't know, over 600 bills that are in process. And uh, just keeping track of what's out there, what's moving, where it is, uh, 
big thank you. That's the truth. Thank you for the sympathy. <laughs> uh, good morning. Rachel Beck, Policy and Communication Director. Manager, sorry, it is getting a little crazy here at the end of the session. Um, the state legislature has to finish their business at midnight tonight. That means that anything that they haven't gotten to um, dies on the calendar, they say. So things have been moving fast in the last week or two, especially um, your legislators are working hard, often closing business at midnight or later. Um, so I'm just going to run through some updates on bills of interest. And then if you have any others you'd like to discuss, happy to do that. Um, I think you've all probably heard that the rain barrel bill has passed. That's one that we've seen several years in a row at the legislative session, much discussion on the effects of those on downstream users. And um, a compromise was reached this year, and so that, that bill will become law. Um, nor, uh, Commissioner Steen has mentioned a number of the transportation bills of interest there were several that the PPACG board had voted to support that were passed. Um, one of them is allowing the State Transportation Advisory Commission to advise the Transportation Commission directly in addition to their role um, offering input to CDOT. Um, and I know Commissioner Steen is especially excited about that one because he puts in a lot of time and, and brain power on that committee representing our region. Um, Off-highway vehicles regulation, uh, that's House 1030, uh, was one that some members of our TAC were following closely. It has a lot of effects on our rural member governments. The governor has signed that one into law. Um, the wildfire mitigation income tax deduction has passed the Senate. I'm not sure it's going to make its way through the House um, as a community with a lot of uh, residential in the wildland urban interface and with our historic fires in recent years. That's one that I know you've all been watching closely. Um, House 1304, which would have directed a, a rather involved procedure to have community meetings on transportation priorities in communities around the state. Um, the board, as you recall, had formerly opposed that bill. Um, thanks in large part to Commissioner Steen's efforts, that one um, was postponed indefinitely in committee. PPACG, uh, cities, counties, CDOT all have extensive processes in place, much more extensive than was out, were outlined in that bill uh, to gather that information. Um, and so we think that those, those processes are best left to continue. The hospital provider fee um, was killed in the Senate Committee uh, on Finance um, yesterday. So that's obviously one that's big news. Everyone's been watching that very carefully because that has a lot of impact on transportation financing. Commissioner Steen, I think you, you sort of mentioned uh, Senate Bill 210, which was introduced very recently and um, proposed new trans bonds with transportation projects for each region around the state as well as um, some statewide projects and dollars that would go to, to projects of statewide interest like transit. Um, that, that bill did die um, in committee. However, I think there are still reasons to be concerned about it. The project list... Um, for the Pikes Peak region included only one of the projects on the board's adopted priority list, which comes out of the regional transportation plan um, that you and our advisory committees have spent so much time on. And so that is of great concern to us locally in a, in a $3.5 billion bond proposal that would have lasted decades um, three, three park and rides and... Right. Three park and rides... Um, and an interchange on powers, that's the one that's on the priority list, We're the only projects for the Pikes Peak region. So that is a matter of great concern to a lot of us locally. Um, what, I, what I am hearing from some of our representatives is that we need to be more vocal in communicating our priorities to them and communicating our priorities to CDOT. So while we do make efforts to do that, what, what we're hearing is we need to do more. So I think we all need to take that to heart and think about how we might do a better job of that. There is one project uh, in the list that, you'll, that you all will be happy to hear was included, and that is the expansion of I-25 um, between Monument and Castle Rock. Though that project is not technically in our region, it obviously has 
uh, a big effect on our region and um, I should mention that actually is in our prior the board's priority list as well because of that regional impact um, and that did make it into this proposal because uh, advocates of that project have been very vocal so the squeaky the squeaky wheel theory works so again even though that bill um, did did die um, it's not the last time that we will see this sort of proposal or this sort of project list um, so we need to keep working on that last bill I'll mention um, was Senate 157 and that was the bill that would halt effort, efforts to implement the Clean Power Plan until the um, Supreme Court case was resolved that bill also died in committee questions or comments on state legislation before I mention a federal item Senate Bill 194, which was the bill that would allow local entities to use sales tax. Oh, yes. Growth, basically a TIF, tax increment finance, to finance local projects. Any updates? I haven't seen. I haven't tried. Uh, you know, I was looking for that one this morning and didn't oh. find it. No, well, I'm, look, oh. I'm looking to my savior in the audience. And okay. All right. Let, let, let me look that up and I'll give you an update in a minute. Follow. Senate 194, okay? Normally, like that bill, they let the motorcycles ride wherever they wanted. Oh yeah, lane, lane split. Yeah, lane, lane splitting on I-25 at 75 miles an hour. Was an interesting bill. Because that works. Yeah, sure. So thanks. I think it's Senate Bill 211. It was the 911 bill um, that went from actually being implemented with the carriers to just being a study. Is that? Do you know any? We have not been following that bill, so I'm sorry. I can't give you an update on that one. Okay, any other questions? Trustee, you said the hospital bill died, but there was like a, a second version of it or, or something that would have taken money from that and sent it into transportation. That's correct. There were um, three bills that were all companion bills. The first would actually change that hospital provider fee to a fee, and then the other two were allocating the funds that would become available from that designation so because the bill that would change how those funds were classified die it renders the other two uh, irrelevant mm -hmm. there's no money to allocate if it's not available right because they were no longer fees they would be taxes and then it would have therefore yeah. <laughs> that was why I called you uh, like a week ago because uh -huh. I thought that was it made no sense to me but thank you other questions yeah, come on up. Oh, Mr. Krakow. Thank you. I'm sorry. And I, uh, sorry. Karen I had asked me to communicate with Rachel yesterday about this matter, and I hadn't. So I get to do it in front of everybody. So, um, <laughs> so uh, just a real quick clarification. You know, Rachel had mentioned making sure that your priorities were heard um, from CDOT's <laughs> perspective, um, you know, so that when folks develop lists like were developed for the Senate bill that uh, reflects your priorities we the agency d did not compile this list um, so I just want to make that clear to folks here I think it is clear but um, you know there the the folks who organized this legislation and the back to this um, the the sponsors of the bills you know kind of cherry-picked from our 228 list and our 10-year development list and you know pick and cho picked and chose those priorities based on what they thought could be successful in the legislature I assume but you know we had no input into that process that, actually, so, that was fairly obvious but thanks for making the point publicly I, I did I did just want to make yeah. that that case and make that clear and then I can tell my boss I actually t talked to the group when I came down here today. So, yeah. Right, yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, it actually uh, ties in with that. And uh, not to rehash old issues, but uh, one of the important things that this uh, 210 raised with me is the reminder of our track record with this type of statewide process and how our region has been, um, you know, left behind in sort of fulfilling some of those promises so if something like this does move forward in the future I would like to see some better guarantee than simply added to the list and uh, whether that's highest priority and first funded or uh, some 
uh, requirement therein so that we are assured that the projects that we do select and prioritize as a region actually do get funded through this. Um, it is concerning when we are obligating so many future funds uh, to repay the bonds into the future and we don't have uh, and we've had a poor track record in the past of getting those projects um, completed for our region. So I just make that side note whether it's for the future legislative session or whether this might get initiated onto the ballot in November. Uh, we need to be uh, keeping our eyes and ears open for that and making sure that we have uh, you know, additional assurances, assurances than simply added to the list because we've been added to the list before and it's not always been 100% successful. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, um, for me, an opportunity, Jeff uh, Sudemeyer from CDOT, uh, one of the programs that CDOT has been working on is a development program, and that's consolidation of list. We want to take just a moment to describe that process, Jeff, and how that might help. Uh, yeah, something happy, like happy this. to do it. Hi, Thank Jeff Sudemeyer. I'm manager of multimodal planning at CDOT. Uh, so, it, and, and Aaron mentioned it too, um, we, we have a, an effort we call the development program, and really what that is has been to try to consolidate a lot of the information that's out there across the state on transportation priorities. Um, we have in the past have had a multitude of lists. We've had 15 different regional transportation plans with varying level of detail on projects and uh, uh, makes it difficult uh, when, uh, when we, we need to articulate priorities, it makes it difficult to sometimes do that. So, We've been trying to bring all of that together in this uh, development program and also anticipate uh, uh, doing some uh, um, additional vetting and conversation with uh, our planning partners in, in the months ahead. And so as Aaron, Aaron mentioned, um, we, uh, we had no input into, into the list for 210, although we did provide um, uh, information that's available publicly on our website that basically shows what the, the projects are out that are out there and the priorities from from different uh, uh, TPRs and MPOs throughout the state. So, yeah, yeah. so just a little context again with the statewide plan is a 2040 plan. There's no mid-range project list or, uh, to queue up uh, projects to move as we move towards the, the tip, uh, the, the four to six year tip. So the 10 year development plan basically allows some vetting and some discussion and some prioritization prior to moving into the formal approval process for the tip step. Any questions for anything else at this time? Oh, I'm sorry, yes, Rob. Uh, not, uh, probably overall, maybe Aaron or Jeff or Rachel uh, or Norm as our stack rep. Um, the one thing at the legislature or tied to it is there's 10 ballot proposals for transportation funding. Um, they, the last I heard, they were going, they had the 10, they were going to get it, get it down to one and try to get one to the ballot. So maybe it's a collective ask. Anyone see the one yet? <laughs> or we still we have still ten to read, and again the ten have a different flexibility. How much transit? How much for capacity? How much for different categories? But they wrote it up. The the group supporting it have written it up. Uh, I just haven't seen if that even went to the legislature to be referred, or that's truly going through the referral process. Uh, yeah, I can. It's another list It'll, that's coming to our And it, it won't be a referral. It'll be an initiative okay. on the ballot this fall. But um, to my knowledge, folks are still vetting the, the 10. Um, there's not a lot of popularity out there for a lot of them. Um, there's a lot of pushback. Um, but I think the folks who are, uh, you know, it's the, the contractors essentially who are, who are backing this, they're working hard to try and come up with the best proposal they can to put on the fall ballot. I think now that we know there's not going to be a bonding uh, measure on the ballot, um, it, it gives them some optimism that, that maybe you know, this being the only transportation measure on the ballot, they could have some success. But I think there are some challenges with consolidating support around any one of those ten. So. Anything else, Rachel? Interestingly, uh, one of the, one or more of those ten proposals does include some language, um, like you had mentioned, Mayor Stevens, and uh, it was something along the lines of guaranteeing a project per TPR or something like that um, on a certain time frame. Um, and Commissioner Steen, I did look up 194, and it died in committee oh. yesterday. Okay. So if I may switch gears to the EPA. <laughs> Any other questions on state? One last one. What about the um, that one, too many notes. 
the, the, uh, the study bill? I guess the Transportation Commission, con uh, what it consists of study bill. I, I don't know. That one has made its way through the Senate, um, so it should be on its way to the governor. Okay. It had a real warm reception in the House, so good to hear it in the Senate mm -hmm. as well. Okay. Again, that, just to remove, that's the one that would uh, restructure the size and scope of the Transportation Commission itself. Uh, uh, perhaps proposing as many as one transportation commissioner per TPR, per MPO. So we would move from a nine-member board to a 15-member board or some combination of math there. So that's what the study would evaluate. Yep. EPA? Yep. Okay. <laughs> All right. If we dare. Yes. The EPA is proposing some changes to its rules on stormwater discharges from construction sites. Uh, these rules expire in 2017, and they're taking comments through May 26th. There are two provisions that staff would like to mention to the board. Um, the first is that the EPA is proposing changing inspection timelines um, for stormwater mitigation measures on these construction sites from seven days to 14. Um, Staff feels that we can, this can adequately be addressed in the two-week time period that is currently mandated. Seven days will not accomplish a whole lot in terms of results, but it will uh, mean increased staff time, which does not come with any funding uh, for that staff time. The second uh, proposal um, is that wash water, when a, when a new home is being power washed, uh, after new materials are put up um, to get rid of dust and debris and things like that, that that wash water be collected separately, analyzed, and trucked off for disposal. Um, it is estimated that this would add about $10,000 to the cost of a new home. Um, so... Staff uh, recommends that you direct us to submit a comment to the APA, EPA on both of those items. Seriously. <laughs> I'll take that as a yes. The question, though, the honest question is the, there must be some reason they started this process, um, uh, and especially being EPA involved. What, what is the result when you power wash a house? I mean, how many chemicals are we actually putting into the ground? And what are the chemicals at? What are they? Uh, it it might turn out to be a little bit more like interesting yeah. to the overall groundwater than we actually ascertain for a house. I, I don't know. I assume there's a reason. And so I'd like to dig further into this, uh, get the details of there. There's a reason for this. So who said it? Why did they say it? And, uh, what is it on our houses that is so toxic now that uh, we have to power wash them off? <clears throat> if the tests are, the water is shipped off with some magical method and the tests come back negative, now what? Hey, that, well, yeah, now what? Tear Kill the bill? Yeah. Wow. Okay. How do you collect it? Uh, that's, that's the operative question. After How do you even collect it? Wow. It. Rain barrels. There you go. Animus water, yes. Okay. Any, any other questions for uh, Rachel Beck? All right. Well, uh, th thank you so much. We'll now uh, consider item eight. That's a proposed executive session uh, open to a motion to proceed. And if a motion passes, we'll take a recess in order to clear the room if, if the motion passes. I'd like to make a motion to move into executive session to discuss personnel issues as um, shown on the open meeting state statute in the, uh, on the, uh, the agenda. I second. A motion to second. Any discussion to move into executive session? Okay, we'll take a vote. All those in favor of moving to executive sessions, by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, we are, we'll take a 10-minute recess.